All right. So uh, Tam basically covered my first slide already, but I am going to talk about using observations to supplement these sorts of inventories. So observational data is really, really easy to use because it's extremely easy to collect. I actually collect it here every single morning. I wake up while I eat breakfast, I kind of look around and I see what birds are here because I know the birds well and I can record them extremely easily. So observational data is something that you can get basically anywhere at any time, but it's very hard to use. It's very hard to get it into a standardized format so you can actually use it for your research and have anyone use it around the world. So the way that you get around this is you have to have a protocol so that everybody does it in the same way so that all of the data is uniform. But at the same time, a lot of people who record observational data are not necessarily as at the same caliber as a lot of scientists. So a lot of you, you study the organisms, you know them really well. And there are other people who may, might be amateur enthusiasts or they know the animals really well, but they might be from somewhere else and might not know the regional animals. And there has to be a way to, uh, to mitigate this and to understand all right, how do we get this data and how we make sure that it's high quality and good enough quality for us to use for our distributional studies? So this is a case study using eBird, sort of to look at it. So eBird is a recent website. It was formed in 2002, and as of 2013, there are 10,000 species by 100,000 users and over you know, 100 million observations of birds from around the world. So this is just a massive data set. And if you look at GBIF, I think eBird might be the single biggest contributor of uh, locality records to GBIF. So it's just this amazing place where everybody who knows birds and who enjoys watching birds can submit their observations and have them count towards science by recording how many of them there were, where they were, and you can even make notes about their behavior. So there are other programs that exist. I'm not as familiar with them. I actually just got contacted by the AfroBats project, which uses photographs of bats in Africa to map their distributions. but. There are a lot of programs like this that are actually in beta stages that they're trying to get working to emulate the, the eBird process. So whatever organism you work with, you should definitely look into that organism for websites such as this to see if there is a place where you can submit your observations just from like when you go to scout at a locality or something like that. So you have to have a template for organizing and documenting the data. And this is especially important if you're doing this with citizen scientists. So if you have a bunch of different people from many different backgrounds who are submitting data, you have to present the data forms in a way so that the people know what they're doing. So this is just an example of an eBird data form. It's a little bit smaller than I thought it was going to be, but this is what Mark showed earlier. So these are actually two checklists from near here. This is the Rumpy Hills, and this is in Equatorial Guinea. So you can see here that for the Rumpy Hills, this is just when Moses and I were scouting out the location. So we didn't have the resources to do the complete inventory at the time or anything, but I was still able to go and document which birds that I was observing and take pictures and recordings and add those to a database where they can be used for distribu distributional records. And when we go and do the inventory, we can look at this list and say, all right, did we find these birds again? Were there different birds? And since this was a different time of year, it might even give us a sense of the seasonality in the area, since we don't have the resources to be there for the entire year. But we do have the resources to send people there for short periods of time. So, and you can even see here, for the one on the right, there was a rare bird here, so I was able to input a recording. And down here in this matrix, I have how many individuals there were of what age and what gender, because I was able to see them well enough. So, and I also have notes here about weather and everything like that, but that's something that's harder to standardize and harder to get a uh, more accurate look at. So, when, once you get all this distributional data and all these observations, you can create really good range maps and you can kind of use this to look at different areas. So this is a type of bird that's endemic to the Cameroon Mountains. This is Lanearius atroflavus. Mark and I were actually almost attacked by a pair of these using his playback method the other day. So they're pretty boisterous birds. It's actually this red dot right here means that it was a recent sighting, and that is actually when we went up there. So our data from the first day that we were here is already online and available for any scientist in the world to use who wants to study this bird. So I can look at this, and I can see that they're found in all of these different mount montane localities, and I can actually click on these localities and see how many birds were observed, who observed them, what the time of year was, and if there's something that's in a weird area, I can even contact the people who manage the database and get more information about this record, or even contact the people who saw it to see what type of birds were there. So even more importantly, the records are all concatenated together so you can see how many of any species of bird was there. So you can get a full set of what was there. So yeah, there we go. So this is just a map of the data coverage for eBird so far. So all these 100 million observations that have been done, every single gray shaded area is an area that has had somebody report bird observations from it. And you can see that some areas are hit really, really heavily and other areas have not been hit very well at all. 
So the United States, of course, is hit very heavily, but it's actually kind of amazing because you can zoom in and you can see some national boundaries on here because you have people who do these studies and stuff in their countries but just don't go outside of that. So, so there, well, I should point out too that a lot of people don't go to like Central Africa, but you can see in Africa that a lot of the bigger cities and stuff are hit pretty well and like Southern Africa especially is really well covered, but nobody really gets north of Southern Africa or outside of some of these areas like Ghana. So. So two of the biggest problems that you have with this are observers. So as I said, if you're using observation-based data, not all these observers are necessarily going to be research scientists. So you have to find a way to standardize the data and also to make sure that people are correct about their observations. So this map that I have here is an example. This is a species of bird that is endemic to Bioko Island. And as you can see, there is an observation record of it from Upper Guinea. So this is actually a taxonomic issue where the person did not know that there are more than the species had been split into more than one species, so they reported the one that they thought they had saw without researching it any further. So they are not incorrect, but they misunderstood what the distribution and the status of the taxonomy was for the species. So you have to have ways to mitigate this and to get around this and to also make sure that the data is correctly sorted after it has been collected. So you know, uh, there need to be more local observers on a global scale as well. So a lot of people are really familiar with the birds in their area. And if you get people working just in their local area, then you can have sort of constant year-round observation records for an area collected on a global scale. So this is really important, especially for places like in the United States. You can get really rich sort of looks at species, especially migratory ones, because you have these people that go to the same places near their work or near their house every single day. And so you can get the dates as they go north across North America and as they go south, and you can track this really well. So it's really good for conservation. And, for understanding the biology of the species. So you also have to have reviewers to go through the data. So as you can imagine with 100 million records, you can't really have people just going through it all the time. So a lot of this effort is volunteer based from people who know areas and who are willing to go through it. So especially for eBird, if you try to submit records, they give you a list of recommended species, which is species that should be occurring in the area. So you actually have to go through a bunch of sort of um, procedures to make sure that you're reporting something that's not on that list. So if I reported something that, you know, is ne not necessarily regular in Cameroon, I would have to confirm it, I would have to provide notes about what I saw and everything before the website would let me submit those data. So it's really important to have these sort of steps to make sure that you can mitigate these problems before they get put into the database because it's a lot harder to go back through the database and find them. So in conclusion, observations can help supplement the knowledge of distribution and community structure in a lot of these different areas. And you can document the change through time really well. So this is a distribution of a species of bird in the United States. You can see from all the distributional records that you can really clearly tell where the limits of the distribution are from all of these different observational records. So it creates a free accessible, that's a free database that's accessible to anyone around the world, which is really nice as well. And you can access those metadata and see how accurate any given observation is. So, that's about it. So if you want to use observation to supplement your data set, it can be very good, but you just need to be very careful about how you do it. Any questions? Okay. It's a very easy thing to access the data. Those, those balloons he had, you can click on those, and the complete list for that particular day comes up, and you can see what was seen in the effort and so forth. So it's really easy to look at those data, you just scroll into where you get those balloons pop up, you click on them, and there's the complete list. Another thing I'll mention is that uh, later in the week, I'll be giving you an example of a description of a new species of bird. Um, and many times when you have a new species, you're, you're trying to put together as much information as you can about that species. And so in the case that I'll be showing you. Um, it was a, it's a, a genus that's very cryptic, very difficult to uh, observe, and also uh, the plumage is essentially of no help, which is to say they're all grayish black. Um, and so in that description, we were attempting to put together all the information available, and what you'll see, we'll go through it in, in detail on Saturday, what you'll see is that we draw on observational data, some of which were misidentified, but they were misidentified in predictable ways that made sense if you didn't understand that this was a species new to science. 
And we also made use of audio recordings that Mark was telling you about that were on Xenocanto. They were available and they were identifiable. But again, some of them had been misidentified because nobody appreciated that there was a species of the science. And so you'll see in that description that we use kind of all three of these data realms that we've talked about, the audio data, the observational data, and the specimen data. So what are the basic equipment that you can use to collect observational data? Uh, it depends on the circumstances and it depends on what you're you're doing. So for a lot of these things, you know, I can be walking around and I can hear birds and I don't necessarily need any special equipment to identify them if I'm comfortable with the species and if I know them well. But usually I personally use binoculars and if I can I take a camera or a sound recorder with me so I can record uh, documentation of any birds that might be unusual or rare. So it just depends on what organisms you're working with and how you need to document that. So when I've gone out with Moses, for example, Moses keeps a list of like all the plants that he sees and the unusual ones he takes some specimens of. So it's just some observational data and then some specimens to back up the observational data. So it's not even in his plots, but he has that data for the Rumpy Hills now. And then he can go back and supplement that to his plot data and show, you know, maybe if he has a tree that he only had once during the plots or didn't have it all during the plots, he knows it's in the Rumpy Hills now because of the observational data, but he doesn't necessarily have that. So depending on what you're working with, you need to get the tools to do that, but you also need to make sure that you're not bogging yourself down and that you can do whatever else you need to do at the same time. 98% so. of those, uh, those data are based on binoculars. Yeah. Site records based with binoculars only. Very few sound recordings associated with that, relatively few photographs. It's mainly through a pair of binoculars. Yeah, and that's part of the reason why you need to mitigate the data when it's being submitted. So a lot of these birds, like for example, here in Cameron, we have these gray-headed sparrows that are everywhere. There's a flock of about 100 of them in the backyard. I don't have pictures of those, I don't have sound recordings of those, but it's a very abundant bird in the area. And so you shouldn't require documentation from every single person that wants to submit observations of those because it is such an abundant bird. But you also need to make sure that if they report something else around here, for example, a gray-green bush shrike or something like that, something rare that's found up in the mountains, you need to make sure that you can, you either know that they observed it really well or request documentation from them of that bird to make sure that you, the observations are genuine. So, yes? Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, if I'm not an ornithologist mm -hmm. and I'm in the field and I see a bird, mm -hmm. maybe I ask my guide, what is, what's the name of this bird? And mm -hmm. he gives me the, the local name. Mm -hmm. Does it exist? the database with the local name, the vernacular name? It depends on what language you're, you're dealing with. So a lot of the local languages, there are not databases that exist for that. And in all local languages as well, similar species of birds will have the same name. So for example, I was just working in Equatorial Guinea and we had a type of bird that was called Strixwood furtii, the African wood owl. And this bird was calling and the local name for that bird is Akun. But Akun also refers to a different species of owl that, refer, that occurs in the area as well. So the vernacular can help you, and it can be very good for documenting all these birds, but at the same time, it can lead to confusion. So there are many, even in English, there are many birds that are not closely related at all that have the same English name because they look sort of similar, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you talked about supplementing inventory with observation. Mm. But uh, what if I want to do a rapid assessment of us, maybe a small area, a big area? Can't I use observation alone to generate viable data? Um, it depends on what area you're working in and what sort of observations you're dealing with. So I used to do point count observations, which are very set, rigorous observations that you repeat over and over and over again, sort of what Town was talking about the other day, where I would stay at the same place and I would do the exact same time duration and everything for recording the species. but. A lot of these data are people doing different trips. So for example, one of the checklists that exists is from Northwest Cameroon where Moses and I had a bike break breakdown and we were stuck on the side of the road for an hour. So we spent the hour just sort of hanging out around there and documenting all the species there. So that's not really re uh, repeatable or anything, but if you, you can use those data as sort of incidental observations. So you can say like this species was observed here, but wasn't during a specific protocol. But if you want to repeat the inventory, get a good sense of what's there, you probably have to go back and do it yourself based off of a specific rigorous regimen. So. Yeah. 